Ah, of course. Um, okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jenny Ferns, Councillor Jenny Ferns, and I'm chairman of the Chair Com Communities and Housing Committee. So can I welcome you to the meeting tonight? My apologies for the lateness, but I was in another committee where we were discussing the government's latest edict on affordable housing, which is going to be interesting when we get the data back. Um, the meeting is being held both uh, is being held at the civic offices and streamed online via YouTube. The members of the committee are present in the chamber, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves shortly. We also have a number of external witnesses as well as council officers joining us in a mixture of in-person and via MS teams. I'll ask them to introduce themselves when they first speak. We're also joined by Councillor Emily Donlington, Cabinet Member for Adults, Housing and Healthy Communities. Um, we also have one resident who is asked to speak on item six of the agenda and his comments are supported by a short paper which has been circulated to the committee and relevant offices. To ensure that we provide a good viewer experience, can I please ask that everybody who is online mutes their microphone and switches off their video feed until they're called to speak. And when you are called to speak, please remember to switch on your video feed and unmute your microphone. Thank you. Um, the housekeeping, a fire alarm test is not scheduled for this evening, so if the alarm does go off, please make your way out of the building via the nearest fire exit. And before we start, please turn off or switch your mobiles to silent. Thank you. Um, apologies and introductions, Liz. Do you have any apologies? Uh, yes, Chair. We have apologies from councillors de Villiers, Fuller, and Nazir. Thank you. Um, and I'll ask each of the members of the committee to introduce themselves and give their award. So, if we start at the back with Andrew and work. Good evening, uh, Councillor Andy Riley, uh, member for Shannybrook End Ward. Good evening, I'm Councillor Pauline Wallace, member of this committee. Good evening, uh, Councillor Scott Ballars from Newport Pagnell South, member of this committee. Good evening, Councillor Ed Hume, a member for Bletchley East Ward and vice chair of this committee. Good evening, Councillor Amanda Marlowe of Lanton and Shenley Ward and vice chair of this committee. Sorry, disclosable interests. Councillors to declare any disclosable pecuniary interests or personal interests, including other pecuniary interests that they may have in the business to be transacted, and officers to disclose any interests they may have in the contract to be considered. Are there any interests to be declared? No? Nope. Right, thank you. Right, we have the minutes on the, of the meeting held on the 30th of November in the agenda pack. Are the minutes agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Um, and I'll sign those later. Um, right. The first main item is the progress on reducing rough sleeping and other forms of homelessness in Milton Keynes. We have a report by Amanda Griffiths, the group head of adult services, on reducing rough sleeping and on other forms of Milton Keynes. It's included in the agenda pack, so everybody should have read it. We are also joined for this item by Tracy McKillen, Chief Executive of the Milton Keynes Homelessness Partnership, and Richard Whiteman, Chair of the Wilson Night Shelter. I'll ask Andrew, um, Amanda to briefly introduce her report, and then I'll ask members of the committee if they have any questions or clarification that they would like to ask. Thank you. Amanda. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Amanda Griffiths. Um, as the Chair said, I'm um, Group Head for Adult Services with responsibility for both rough sleeping and homelessness. Um, I have a colleague with me tonight, um, Sarah Nixon, who um, uh, is the Service Manager for Mental Health, Rough Sleeping and Mental Health Services, and uh, uh, Tracy McKellen, um, Chief Executive of the um, Milton Keynes Homeless Partnership and Richard Wideman, who is chair of the uh, Winter Night Shelter and chair of the Milton Keynes Homeless Partnership. Um, uh, so I'm just going to very briefly introduce my um, uh, report, and um, as I, I hope you have read it, but I was going to pull out some some main some some main points really. 
So I'm going to start with rough sleeping, and um, just for clarification, really, um, those people who are rough sleeping are always homeless, but homeless people are not always rough sleepers. So rough sleeping really is the tip of the iceberg as when we think about homelessness. Um, in our annual count, which we do um, and is done nationally, um, all local authorities do a count um, on a night in November every year, and that is um, included as part of the, the government's um, target to, to end rough sleeping. Um, we identified 18 people in Milton Keynes who were rough sleeping. That number is um, exactly the same as it was in 2020, um, but is a significant reduction, actually, since 2017, when the same count we identified and found 48 people. So I think we've done, you know, that's, that's, that is, you know, really good um, reduction. And actually, if you think about 2020, at the, that time, we actually had um, the everyone in um, policy. So in fact, all rough sleepers, we were required to accommodate. Um, so we had hotels open. So to have 18 people when we didn't have everyone in, I think is, is um, a testament really to the work that's been done in Milton Keynes. Um, since October 2021, the rough sleeper team um, actually is now provided by Milton Keynes Council. Um, I think that's been extremely successful. Still, very, you know, still isn't, we've not been um, responsible for the services to people who are rough sleeping on the street for very long, but we've already seen some really good outcomes from that work. I really wanted to focus um, on the work that we've do, been doing in partnership really with the Winter Night Shelter, with um, the Business Improvement District and the, the uh, network rail around people who are sleeping in tents in central Milton Keynes. So um, in mid middle of November, we had 11 people sleeping in tents in central Milton Keynes. And as of um, now, we've only got one person who's sleeping in a tent in central Milton Keynes. Um, we, we offer support to people who are sleeping in tents. Sleeping in a tent is never safe. Um, and we're very clear about that to people, and we do offer support to people to um, to go into a set to emergency accommodation before we then do further work with them about their their homeless situation. I mean, rough sleeping really is probably the area which is very most complex when we think about homelessness because there are a number of different factors that take people and make people take a, you know a decision either to to sleep on the street or find themselves in that situation. Um, it can be a myriad of issues around um, broken relationships, um, uh, drug and alcohol issues, mental health issues. So um, it does need a multidisciplinary approach to support people. Um, working in partnership is key um, in, in when we think about rough sleeping. Um, and we work very closely with um, the uh, Milton Keynes Homeless Partnership and the Winter Night Shelter. Um, the Homeless Partnership, in particular, we've been working to encourage um, rough sleepers to take up COVID vaccination, um, and which is particularly important when we think about the um, poor physical health of, of many rough sleepers. We've also continued to work very closely with the Winter Night Shelter, and I'll let Richard talk about that in a moment. But um, you know, the, uh, we're working closely with, with um, Winter Night Shelter on our development of our emergency accommodation for um, single homeless men, which um, will be above where the Winter Night Shelter is currently providing its service downstairs. And then finally, um, some people who, who have been rough sleeping um, really need very specialist support on, a, on quite a, a long-term basis, you know, sort of six, six months to, to a year. And we actually have two accommodation-based services for people who have been rough sleeping, which is Orchard House and Norman Russell House, um, with a combined bed space of 41 beds, um, with 24-hour support to that. And, and that very much, that focus is around helping people to start to engage with things like drug and alcohol services, understand what holding a tenancy means, and actually then also linking with other services. And the Rough Sleepers team works very closely with those two services. And then finally, 
Finally, I wanted to mention funding. There is a full breakdown of funding in my report on page 18 of the, of the pack. But um, so for this financial year, um, for rough sleeping, we have um, uh, 1.3 million for, from the rough sleeper initiative bid, um, and Milton King Council themselves, ourselves, have, have actually funded um, £480,000 into um, services that directly support people who have been rough sleeping. Thinking about um, homelessness now, and as I say, homelessness is obviously much wider. Milton, Keene, Milton Keynes actually ranks 13th out of 313 local authorities in England. Um, that is, when we consider that Luton is 17th, Central Bedfordshire is 220th, and Bedford Borough is 221st. Um, that tells you quite a lot about the demand in Milton Keynes around homelessness. Um, our three main um, areas of um, reason for people becoming homeless is um, families no longer willing to accommodate um, somebody who, who has been living with them, um, domestic abuse, and um, where somebody has also lost a tenancy. Um, unfortunately, um, we don't have enough supply of temporary accommodation or um, social housing um, for all the people that, are, that approach us who are homeless or the households that approach us. So, um, you know, we have at the, in the, at the last resort have to use hotel accommodation and I've included in my report information about that. I've got a real bang up to date information on, on hotel accommodation and we've currently got 119 households in hotel accommodation at the moment. Um, of those, um, the majority actually are single. We do have families, we have families um, with um, you know, 18 families at the moment, um, three childless couples, 74 single males and 24 single females. So when we consider actually the housing, housing needs analysis and what we really need, as far as moving those people into more settled accommodation, we actually, you know, our analysis it tells us that actually we need 94 single homes, single bedded homes, um, and you know, this is actually driven by the the change in the in the Housing Act in uh, 2018 with um, the uh, introduction of the Homeless Reduction Act, when um, single people. Um, with, with additional needs became, um, you know, um, had a right to, be, to, to present themselves as homeless and we have a, a duty to, to assess them. Um, and that it, this is not unusual. This is the same across England where most local authorities would say that the majority of the households who are presenting are single. Um, I just would like to just invite Richard just to speak about his experience of homelessness in Milton Keynes and then after you've spoken, Richard, if I could ask you, Tracy, to do the same. Okay, thank you. I'm Richard Whiteman. I chair the Winter Night Shelter and I also chair the Homelessness Partnership, but uh, Tracy will speak for that. I think three things that I've noticed that have got more difficult over the last decade. First of all, the complexity of cases that we're dealing with uh, is far greater than it, than it was five, ten years ago. Um, so combinations of mental health issues, substance abuse, inability to handle finances, low skills to handle um, relationships and so on. It's, it just, it, it tend, people tend to come with two or three of those, not one these days so that actually means that the working together becomes far more important and yeah and it's and it's also slower it's a lot slower sorting them out so complexity case was my first point i think the second one is that the scale of the need uh, has increased uh, but particularly amongst the vulnerably housed so we see uh, on our community club on tuesdays and wednesdays we have 60 or 70 people coming along and the vast majority are now housed but in circumstances where they are at risk of a yeah, significant risk of becoming homeless again. So scale of need, I think, has, has gone up a lot. Um, 
I think um, the third thing I'd say is that I am very pleased with the progress on working uh, alongside one another. I think that has improved massively, uh, certainly particularly over the last three, four years. But actually, I've seen a steady improvement over a decade. Um, Councillor Darlington said something um, to a, a group, including myself, a couple of weeks ago, where she talked about seeking partnership rather than parenting. And actually, I thought that was, that was spot on. The, the attitude I experienced in the council probably 15 years ago was very much we wanted to tell everybody what to do. Uh, it's far better now in terms of working alongside each other. So I'm very pleased and very encouraged about that sort of long-term shift. So um, my other two points would be, I think I've seen quite a lot of uncertainty about the future of government uh, actually, the future of the government approach, and so that's partly funding accommodation and you know what will be available and in what forms. Um, for us, um, attitudes to dormitory style accommodation have shifted quite significantly during the pandemic and now back again, and now a little bit back. So, it the there was a stage where they were, the central government was very anti-dormitory style accommodation. Now that approach has softened, and I'm not sure where it's all going to end up. Right? It's, certainly, it's certainly individual um, uh, units are you know, far more attractive, better, but, but I think that dormitory style accommodation is better than nothing. Yeah? So if you can't get to fully everybody in individual units, it's better than nothing. And then my final point um, is that... I think out-of-town placement, uh, that has increased significantly and is quite a problem, um, partly um, because of distance from people's own sort of support networks, but also because of the loss of support services. Um, so it makes that far more difficult. We actually found a company that were willing to provide uh, pay for bus passes so that we can we simply give people the means um, to get back to Milton Keynes, where most of their things like GP support services and so on you know, have been located. But I would encourage the council to make every effort to minimise out-of-town accommodation. But I appreciate with the way prices have gone up in Milton Keynes, uh, you know, what, it, it really does come down to what you can lay your hands on. Yeah. So I think those will be my, my points. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tracy McKillen and I'm the Chief Executive of the Milton Keynes Homelessness Partnership. And just my opening line about the partnership is that we are a network of 35 organisations across Milton Keynes, uh, all of whom we call recognised partners, one of which is our partnership with Milton Keynes Council. I would echo everything that Richard has just said, but I'd also like to pay tribute to uh, Victoria Collins, Amanda Griffiths, um, Mick Hancock, and the teams that work within those departments for how they have shifted the narrative and shifted to very much partnership and collaborative working, certainly over my tenure over the last two years. So I am new to Milton Keynes and came to it with a very uh, different lens than, than colleagues that have spoken previously. Um, as I said, I am seeing a huge improvement in the partnership approach, and that's certainly something that's welcomed by the voluntary sector, um, and I know is welcomed by colleagues at Milton Keynes Council as well. And we see ourselves as a conduit and a bridge and a platform for both and all of the partners within that sector to be able to come together, uh, consult, share good practice, and look at a solution-based approach. There, there has been a huge uh, amount of work that we have seen that is very positive and the feedback again from colleagues within the voluntary sector and they have paid testament also to how the council and staff um, manage the incredibly difficult two-year period we've had over the pandemic and have been very vocal at some of the very positive things that have been put in place over the course of that and also the learning culture that came from that and being able to implement that learning for example through everyone in and through the um, central hub that was established uh, during the hotel accommodation. 
despite the great strides that have been taken, and I hope that that, that sort of preamble will give you a sense of how we are feeling about uh, working in partnership in Milton Keynes, there are still, as you would expect, many areas um, that all of the network, including uh, colleagues at Milton Keynes Council, have highlighted that still need uh, some additional attention. Uh, something that comes to the forefront quite frequently is very an operational but very much the front door of the council and looking at the referral process and being able to look at the nuts and bolts of that so that when people like Winter Night Shelter are looking at individuals coming and knocking on the door and the referrals are made, that they can have a very good experience from start through to finish. Again, I think it hasn't gone unnoticed, the changes that have been made and the changes that continue to be made and also the approach of being willing to sit down and unpick that and, and work together to find the solutions that can benefit all. So we're very grateful for that. Also, uh, alluding to... Um, Amanda Griffith's uh, reference to the COVID vaccination group, the COVID action group. I think that's a particularly good example of how we've worked together and really made a huge difference to a number of individuals across Milton Keynes and been able to really bring a number of partners into that as well. The, I've got final couple of points. One is around the communication. I think the communication within the sector has been vastly improved over the last two years. And again, I extend my thanks to the officers within the council for embracing the partnership and the very many questions we were bringing to the table. I think we all recognize there is far more to be done, but we're certainly in, in the right territory and certainly traveling in the right direction. And I would like to encourage all that are involved uh, within the local authority to look at very much a connected up approach which does stem from that comms agenda both internally and externally where we bring to the forefront both planning, health and well-being, um, the rough sleeping and prevention team and housing all together to actually look at all of the different multi-layers and complexities um, that homelessness and rough sleeping presents. And finally, in terms of working with the partnership itself, I am hugely pleased in how we have been able to support um, colleagues in their delivery within the local authority, how we have the benefit of the expertise of both Amanda Griffiths and Victoria Collins on our board of trustees, and also through a number of other committee structures and long may that continue. Um, and also going forward as we continue to look at the next steps for the partnership, given the fact we are in our infancy um, as far as an organization is concerned, that we know that we can rely upon the support of Milton Keynes Council um, at every step to ensure the sustainability of the partnership, but also that we continue to build on the great work that's gone before. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, it's good to see very complimentary reports coming back about the, at least the rough sleepers part at the moment. The homelessness part is more challenging. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not clear whether you want to make a presentation or, or, or input now. No, right, okay. Um, so I'll open it up to the committee, but I'll just lead off with one question first. We have roughly the same sort of number of people in temporary accommodation that we had last year, but we're having to put people outside the borough, which in general we weren't last year. So what has changed significantly? I think the market has changed significantly. Um, you know, the, the housing market in particular is very hot at the moment in Milton Keynes. Um, um, that actually means that, in fact, you know, when we look at um, people losing their private rented accommodation, it's very often because a landlord is selling their, um, you know, their asset um, and realising their asset and their investment. So, um, you know, we are seeing that. Um, that, you know, it's, it's, you can't prevent that. You, know, you can't give the landlord addition, you know, an incentive not to sell because that they've made their decision to sell. You know, very different when you've got um, uh, rent arrears because we can work with landlords and uh, tenants around rent arrears, you know, to be able to um, potentially um, 
you know, support that um, landlord to, to, to cover off that, um, that arrears. So um, I suppose the other thing is, of course, last year we had everyone in. And of course, um, you know, we, um, if you look at the, the single people who are out of area, a proportion of those would have actually been covered by everyone in this time last year. So actually, you know, uh, we had 80 people at one point in the hotels last year. So you've actually, you know, and you look at the numbers of singles currently, I think those people would probably have been in a hotel in Milton Keynes last year. And of course, we, at the moment, hotels, you know, obviously hotels now are opening and trading, so they're not quite so willing to um, accommodate people in Milton Keynes, actually particularly single people. You know, we still, we still manage to get... Um, accommodation locally for for families even though you know that is very very last resort and you know you know we, we don't have many but we don't want any um, but you know we have some hotels who flatly refuse to to work with with single people um, which is why we have to go out of area uh, regrettably okay thank you I'd, I'd guess that adds up to at least 200 extra people or, or places lost effectively so that certainly that means that you're doing quite well to keep it down to 22 outside the borough <laughs> um, and for the look of it apart from the, the one bedroom that we know about and where more is coming through there's nothing there's no particular type of accommodation that's now short apart from that I mean, really, it is. It, 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 in the main, it's one, one and two bedrooms. You know that we're not really. You know, we we do absolutely get large families coming through, but not so much. It, you know, if we look at, you know, our we I do I chair a temporary accommodation panel every day, um, and you know, majority of those are single people, or um, you know, uh, single. Uh, or, or pregnant women who, you know, family can no longer accommodate. Um, so absolutely what we're looking for and what we're working with supply and acquisitions to do is to, is to find us, um, you know, much more single accommodation. Yeah, that's, that's where our need is. But that, again, sits with the changes in the Homeless Reduction Act, and we would expect to see that. Open it up. Great. Um, so I've got a number of questions, but I'll probably just start with maybe just two and then maybe just let anyone else go around. Um, you mentioned about the hotels no longer there. They're quite difficult to engage in terms of wanting to accommodate single people compared to families. Is there any particular reasons why, apart from maybe the trade reasons, um, that they're, they're, they've got pain punters, shall we say? Um, in reality, sort of building on, on Richard's point, because the, the people coming through are more complex. So actually some of the behaviours that come with people are, are, are more difficult to manage in a hotel setting. Um, and, um, you know, some hotels may have had a poor experience. Although we are offering more support because we now have a rough sleepers team, which Milton Keynes didn't have before, although we were working with a voluntary sector partner it's still quite difficult to build that confidence when they you know, only need one, one bad experience to really impact on a hotel manager's confidence to, to work with us with single people. So just building on that, in terms of when we, we've talked about then housing needs in terms of some more single homes, but actually we do need single homes, but they need to be potentially with more support around them. So not just single homes, so that's... that's a, kind of what I'm getting a little bit from that. Um, just in terms of the biggest reason that um, we're seeing um, people uh, moving out of homes is um, the family no longer wishing to willing to accommodate. That's probably quite a broad category, but there's quite a lot in that. So I'm just trying to get underneath the, the covers, um, so to say, and why are, what are the reasons for that? And I'm sure there's a whole plethora of different issues. And also, well, I know there's a lot of sofa surfing as well, so that 94 could quite quickly increase if that family circumstances change. Um, if I just mention the support bit first, because, you know, last year we, we delivered um, a project around um, 
purchasing 30 new homes for former rough sleepers with support, and 28 of those people are still in those homes. So actually, you're right, you know, if we get the support right, then there's more chance that they're being stopping that revolving door of, of, of homelessness. So absolutely, councillor, you know, we're on the right, you're on the right track there. Um, and we want to, we recognise that, and I think the government now recognises that just giving us money without suggesting that that's used in a particular way around supporting people on a more long-term basis is, is, is absolutely what, what we need to do. Um, around family no longer accommodating, um, there's a myriad of issues and reasons there. Um, it's, I think it's probably worth us thinking about doing a bit of work around this. Um, some of it appears to be that um, th there's still this um, assumption that you know, uh, moving into temporary accommodation is where you wait for your council property. Um, whether that's true or not, I mean, that's a, that's a feeling. I don't know if that's true. Some of it's that people have just been so, sofa surfing or actually sleeping on a sofa with their family for a long time and situating families need to change and they just can't continue to accommodate. Um, so we'd have a... It, and they're not all young people. Some of them are, you know, 30, 35 and living with older older um, relatives so um, or friends um, so so many different reasons um, um, you know it's and it certainly isn't all you know, young people I mean and we have got things like the connect you know our, our connect service um, that DePaul um, provide for us where if it is a young person under the tw age of 25 we can refer to that service who will help to do some mediation around relationships if those relationships have become fraught unfortunately often they've reached well beyond that point and actually you know family really say no you know it, enough's enough um, so I probably haven't answered the question very well I think probably it, it might be a piece of work we might want to do into the future about understanding that a bit better because actually with those three top reasons for um, homelessness ideally what we need is a range of um, preventative options around each of them um, to be able to start to really, you know, start impacting on, on homelessness in Milton Keynes. Yeah, I was just wanted to just follow up. Um, Amanda, just uh, quickly, because uh, I went and had a look um, around Norman Russell House, um, I think it was in the summer, and, um, you know, was very impressed by what I saw and you know how they worked and I wondered are you planning on having another Norman Russell house or another orchard house is there sufficient capacity in order to build another one So it's a good question, Amanda, but we're currently looking at all of the options and trying to understand in more detail what the needs coming through. You've seen the three major reasons that, that are coming through. Families unwilling to accommodate, and as Amanda said, that's not one category. That can be anything from um, somebody coming out as uh, LGBTQI plus and the family not wanting to accommodate. It could be literally COVID has gotten to that family and then relationships broke down because they were all locked in together for a significant amount of time. Or it could be, as Amanda said, there there is a bit of a rumor going around that this is the way you get your council house and it definitely isn't the way you get your council house. Um, that is always done on priority needs so you will not get it quicker as a single young person um, than somebody who, you know, if you've been in temporary accommodation, you will get it because you meet the other allocations policies. The other one is the ending of AST. So as Amanda said, is, you know, I've just written to Michael Gove again saying, when are you going to suspend section 21 notices? That's significantly high. Of course, we had that suspended during COVID and it made a significant <coughs> difference to the numbers coming through the door. So when Jenny says what's changed, that's one of the things that's changed is section 21 notices are back in play. 
Um, so there's a lot of work going on with landlords, but because of the heated housing market and they're selling up, that's very difficult. And then the final one that I draw the committee's attention to is domestic abuse. That is the third highest. Um, and it's one looking across at domestic abuse services. It's not significantly, it's not one we think is going to significantly go down. In fact, we're looking at it going up. So when you ask about what kind of accommodation we need going forward, we've got to look at all the different kinds. Obviously, we do have our accommodation for fam uh, families to suffering from domestic abuse. Um, that's always full, uh, and there's a shortage across the country. There's also these complex needs that Richard and Amanda and Tracy have all alluded to, um, uh, and we see that significantly with, with people trying to sustain tenancies through mental health, drug and alcohol addiction, and, um, and trying to engage the NHS much better on mental health, but also using our new community support uh, workers out in the community in mental health to support people maintaining their tenancy. So it's, it, it, there's no one size fits all. There's no, this is the typical rough sleeper or homeless person, but there is, there are some key drivers and we do need to, as a council, make some really important decisions alongside the advice and input from our partners in the, in the community and voluntary sector about what is the right approach here in Milton Keynes. Um, so you're right to identify it, but that's the process of work that we're trying to unpick at the moment um, and we'll do over the next, into the next financial year. No, I didn't say we, we are or we aren't yet. We don't know. We're looking at Norman Russell House, Orchard House. We also, we've got the Salvation Army that provide that kind of supported accommodation. We have other charity partners that we work with. What's the name? One of the Mace, the Mace, uh, Amaze, yeah. That's the one up in Newport Pagno that also su supplies um, additional skills and they give them a job. And so there's different kinds of providers. What's the provide? What kind of outcomes are we getting from those providers? What are we doing to stop the entry? Right? Because we can talk all we want about what we do with them, people once they're homeless, but actually what we want to do more of is the prevention side to make sure people don't become homeless in the first place. So how can we intervene earlier before they lose their tenancy? How can we make sure that we, you know, so there's a lot of effort that Amanda's been working on and, and this is a really important part with our relationship with the community and voluntary sector because people, the council can be, you know, it's official. <laughs> Right? People don't necessarily want to tell us first that they're in trouble, that they're getting into debt. And with the cost of living crisis, oh, you know, and that not looking like it's going to improve in the near to medium term future, we need to be getting people to speak to us or community and voluntary sector partners much, much earlier so we can actually do that prevention. So the answer is we're looking at it all right now, Amanda, because we think it's going to get a lot worse. Any other questions from the committee? No? Right, okay, I'll come back in with one more. Um, a year ago, you said that a large proportion of the people coming homeless were young, under 25. Is that still true? Not so much now. Okay, that, that's good. It's, it's, it, it hasn't changed hugely, actually, um, Chair. Um, there's always a proportion of, of under 25s, but actually the, the majority of people who become homeless actually are in the 25 to 40 age group rather than the under 25s. Right, so it's those who cease to be able to afford the accommodation they're in or whatever. Yeah, okay, right, okay. Um, okay, does anybody want to put forward comments or questions or recommendations? Yeah, I've still got um, some questions. This is probably about, this isn't about money, essentially. Um, in table one of the, the report, um, it's got the details about the 2022-23 year, and there's still a huge gap in terms of the rush for sleeping initiative with um, it stating that there's not yet a three-year settlement. How is that going to impact the work? What, what are the risks involved in terms of what is, if that money doesn't appear, 
what is going to have to change in terms of the work that's been delivered? Or where is that funding going to come? Is it going to come from in turn some sort of reserves? Um, do you want to take that, Emily? So, I mean, this is not an area that we can turn away from, and it takes the sustained investment. Um, the, we're really grateful to the funding that the government's given us. Unfortunately, it has been kind of ad hoc, and it has been on their terms, um, and not necessarily what we think we need. And so uh, we had, I had a call with the homelessness minister not too long ago, um, and myself alongside other local government, um, uh, other ca local government cabinet members, uh, were really clear that we have different issues in different areas, and we need to allow us that flexibility. And as I said, everybody feels that this problem is going to get worse over the next couple of years because of the cost of living um, uh, crisis. Um, and so, actually, what we need is a longer term, not ad hoc funding from government and we also need our partner other public sector partners like the NHS and like the police to be given the funding that they need to be able to properly support uh, in these areas not least in with domestic abuse um, and um, and and so it's not just a council solution nor is it just a council problem but we are the ones at the end of the day they get left holding the bill <laughs> in that sense um, and so it is a significant risk if government doesn't continue to fund us but certainly in our discussions in cabinet um, it is something that we will continue to prioritize here in Milton Keynes because it is something that is com very very important to this administration just on the timing of the rough sleep initiative Bit as well, um, Councillor. It's not unusual. This is not un unusual. Um, it's not. It's unhelpful, but not unusual for the rough sleeper initiative bid for us not to know yet. So the rough sleeper initiative bids always very, very late. Our bids in, um, but um, we're always down to the wire um, as far as knowing what settlement will be. Um, this year, it's a three-year settlement which is better than it has been. Um, but we won't, probably won't know until May. But we have some guarantee of funding for the first quarter. Unfortunately, that's been true for the last several years. So <coughs> it's a crazy way to run a service. Yeah. And particularly one on which people's lives literally depend. OK. Do we have any recommendations? Do we have any points we want to consider for the future, yes, Ed? So I think we need to acknowledge the comments, especially that Tracy were making about the, the work that the council and the other partners are working collaboratively and the change that we've seen there and, and the comments around the work that Victor, Victoria, Amanda, Mick are all doing and, and the work that they are doing collaboratively. Um, Elizabeth, did you get some of those kind of comments from Motor Down or...? I was just sum up, maybe. <laughs> That's good. Uh, yeah. Um, and then I think there was a point, and I'm just trying to find it in my notes. Come back to me, I'm just, I'll come find it in my notes in a moment. Sorry, can I just ask one final question? Are you working with schools at all now to introduce information into them about the nature of the housing market and the nature of the need? Because this is something we highlighted in the last couple of years, and I've not heard that it's happening yet. If we did that, we might possibly get some of those cases earlier that, that were family breakdown cases. We're not working with schools, but the Youth Cabinet has been working with DePaul and YMCA sorry. around this. Uh, sorry, so when, whilst we're not working with schools, the Youth Cabinet has been working around, um, doing some work around homelessness, and has actually um, been working with DePaul, who is our Reconnect service around mediation, and with the YMCA. 
and they've actually produced, um, and it, it will be going up in um, Central Woods of Keynes, a piece of artwork about reaching out and talking to people about homelessness and, and it, you know, if you're worried about things. So um, they have been particularly um, active in this, in this sphere. Um, and, you know, the work with DePaul in particular and working alongside the, the Homeless Partnership, um, you know, we do, they do reach out a lot to, to younger people. We also work very closely, of course, with, um, with children's services colleagues as well. Okay. I would have thought the chances are the schools have a good idea of which 17, 18 year olds, for instance, are sleeping on sofas and therefore are quite likely to become the adults at 24, 25 who get ejected eventually. Um, and I wonder if we could do more in advanced preparation work to try and deal with that problem before it happens and deal with the family tensions. Or at least get it more visible because part of the problem is, is that we don't know what's going to hit us next because we don't know what part of the community is sofa surfing at the moment. Something changes for that part and suddenly we get hit with it, suddenly they become visible. Um, I think we're very aware um, that in terms of prevention, you're quite right, in terms of what's coming, um, we we know that there's an awful lot more work that we need to do, uh, especially kind of really downstream prevention in so many different areas because so many different things um, can lead to homelessness. So, um, so we're, we're thinking we're on doing some work at the moment around um, just welfare benefit uptake, for example, across Milton Keynes as a whole to try and maximise that um, and uh, increase our knowledge around that. So... Um, I think it, it's it's a good point, um, but I'd say it's kind of one of the in terms of prevention. It's one of the many things that we 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 would like to concentrate on um, going forward, and we do want to kind of push prevention more downstream, which is always the challenge with prevention, isn't it? How how, how early can you can you get involved, and the the earlier the better. But um, we're we're not there yet. But, but it's certainly um, something that, that we're concentrating and looking at doing more on, um, focusing on our front door, as we've talked about, getting that right and getting that response early as possible um, to avoid evictions and keep people in their homes and then pushing that even further back. So. I'm just trying to work out. So, yeah. Is that timing right? Do we have a few more minutes on this item still? Do we have a few more minutes on this item still? Could we ask, could we ask you to talk a bit about what you are looking at for prevention? Because that's obviously absolutely key to getting control over it for the future. Thank you. Yeah, go on. Um, I think one recommendation is, I mean, whether we can get, if, if you're not far, far enough down that line, maybe prevention is probably going to be a little bit difficult to necessarily get into huge amounts of detail on that. But I think it would be a recommendation for this committee is for someone to come back to this committee, looking at some of that underlying courses that we followed off the question that I asked earlier, for that to come back to this committee and for us to have a, a, a good delve into that um, and what what other services we, we need to provide to, to help with that prevention. So we can compromise by having just a little flavour because we are literally for once ahead of time. So let's just have two or three minutes on what are the main things you're looking at. If I might just add to that in terms of the, the recommendation about looking at those underlying principles, I think there's, there's two things I would add to it. That's certainly something we would be very, very um, willing and um, interested in supporting uh, and unpicking. And, and also the wider underlying issues. I have already had conversations with Amanda about establishing some leaders in the sector, both from within um, Milton Keynes and nationally, to establish a think tank so that we can have some headspace to really get under the skin of why Milton Keynes is placed 13th and why these issues are recurring. So there is certainly thinking and conversations afoot with that, but the partnership would be very interested in doing that. Okay, so I think we have that as a recommendation that that topic comes back. 
um, either to this committee or just possibly to a workshop session or something where we might actually be present when some of those people talk to you and, and hear the sort of thing they're saying. But, uh, we will let the planning group for next year consider that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it will be wise to let the partnership and the council work together and not involve necessarily this committee in those workshops because yeah. it's probably best that the, prof the professionals, shall I say, well, I'm, not, well, I'm not sure why I'm doing that because you're all professional, rather than us who are the laymen maybe being involved in those workshops. So. Right. Coming back to scrutiny instead. Amanda, were you waving a hand for a recommendation or not? Sorry? Were you indicating a recommendation or not? No. No. Okay, right. So is that it? I think, thank you very, very much. Can we really commend the quality of what you're doing? Because to have kept the same number, roughly, of people in temporary accommodation when the demand has grown considerably and to have reduced the number of rust sleepers while it is uh, at the same time and be working together as happily as you are is, is a really major step forward. So thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, are people happy to go straight on with the other major item or do you want a quick break? No, you're happy, right, okay. Um, in which case, thank you to any officers who are leaving and let's shift. We're now shifting to a different sector, which is talking about private centre housing. But before that, David Lee of the um, residents in regeneration estates has asked to speak to us about aspects, some of which link to that and some of which are more general aspects. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I understand the, uh, the paper we've produced has gone round the committee, and so I won't, won't try reading it through. Um, I will comment, though, on the, uh, the four points at the top. Um, the first one is the whole business of HMOs, um, uh, uh, creation and operation. Um, let me tell you a little story. Um, there was a household which consisted of um, one couple and two single people, unrelated to each other, uh, living in a rented property. Um, being four people, it was less than uh, the five which make it an HMO, so there was no problem at all, until the couple had a baby. And then, technically, it becomes an HMO. Now, that is how easy it can be in strange circumstances for uh, things to become HMOs. Um, uh, what ended up happening in that situation was um, actually the, the, the house was owned by somebody who was living abroad. It was basically their family home. They wouldn't have been interested at all in uh, uh, doing any modifications to bring it up to HMO standards, um, and said they wanted their house back. Um, and as far as I'm aware, that six-bedroom house is currently unoccupied. All right. <laughs> um, in which just... case, please could you pass the address to the council and they will work on getting it occupied. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Seriously, yeah. if anybody knows unoccupied houses that are unoccupied for some time, please pass the addresses in. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, from the resident's point of view on an estate, um, an HMO isn't whether it's on a register or not. Um, it's the sort of the feel of the house. Of um, well, there's an awful lot of cars there, or um, they don't know what to do with their rubbish. Um, uh, they don't get involved with the estate. Um, now, all right, that sometimes is crossing this line of five people. Sometimes it may not be crossing this line of five people, but be seen by the residents as an HMO. Uh, I don't think there's any easy way around that. Um, the, the other side of that is educating people in HMOs into to how to behave on the estate. Um, one of the initiatives on Tinker's Bridge that we're, we're working on is a handbook for new residents giving you all the local information. Uh, now, it isn't running very smoothly at present. It's, uh, it got tied up with editing. But, but, but information being available to, to people who've just moved into an HMO, telling them where, what to do with their rubbish, where you can park, where is considerably frowned upon for parking, um, can be useful. Um, so that's HMOs. Energy efficiency. You've got 
30 seconds, David. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realise on the time limits on today. Sorry. Uh, energy efficiency. Uh, Milton Keynes uh, wants to be energy efficient. Um, uh, the best thing is uh, for houses is installing insulation. That is not a quick fix. It needs planning. It needs doing. Um, it costs. Um, rental costs. These reflect through into fuel poverty, and they also reflect, uh, uh, um, you know, sorry, into fuel poverty, and also into the amount of um, people needing food banks and similar. Um, repairs, uh, as a note that 25% of private uh, rents are in the non-decent category, um, which is a high proportion. Um, within Milton Keynes, uh, when there were seven estates listed for regeneration, I think some landlords put back doing anything because they weren't sure whether the house was going to stay up or be taken down. Now, I know that's now long in the past, um, but sometimes memories of those things hang around and landlords never get around to doing things. Um, way forward, one of the ways forward, I think, is, is enforcement. Um, uh, was, I think this is happening on litter and fly tipping at present. There's been far more visibility of prosecutions on that. I think that's giving people more confidence to be able to speak up and say um, th this needs action and to have some belief that the council actually will respond and will take suitable action. All right, I'm probably out of time now. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, I think... Go to the main paper because the main. Chair. Sorry. Sorry. Over the page. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Officers have prepared a written response to those questions, but which they will circulate tomorrow. Um, but I'm sure that some of those topics will come up later on in the discussion anyway. So. We have a report by Lucy Tucker, who is the council's private sector housing manager. Is she online? Yeah. Yes, right. Um, which hopefully everybody will have read. So, Ed, are you trying to speak? No, no, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, can we get the big screen on? Is the big screen switched on? Is it just that? Button is not first. <laughs> There's what looks like a power button in the corner at the front, but I don't know. Ah, fine. <laughs> Sometimes the simple solution is <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, so if I can ask Lucy to briefly introduce her report and then we'll have questions and comments from members of the committee and indeed the resident who is present if they wish. Thank you. Certainly. I hope you can um, <clears throat> see me and hear me okay. Um, so I'm Lucy Tucker, Private Sector Housing Manager. Um, so the service is responsible for the regulation of housing conditions in the private sector and the report outlines activities we undertake to improve property conditions and raise standards of accommodation. Uh, one of our main priorities for next year is to carry out a 10-year intelligence stock condition survey, and this is aimed at identifying non-compliance in relation to energy efficiency standards, HMO licensing, and health and safety. Um, and this survey and the feedback we get from that survey will also enable us to reach tenants who perhaps don't, um, for whatever reason, report issues. So we can offer them support and engage with their landlords to make improvements. Uh, the report also details the volume of contacts we receive from private tenants and the interventions and enforcement action taken to ensure properties are safe and hazards are removed or reduced to an acceptable level. Um, there is a breakdown in the report of the types of enforcement notices issued, um, and some of these include improvement notices and civil penalties. Uh, the report also briefly describes how the service is publicised. And lastly, there is an update and information on the new landlord accreditation scheme, um, which is aimed at supporting landlords to ensure that they have the appropriate skills and knowledge to manage their properties by providing a wide, a wide range of uh, specialist training courses. 
Um, and obviously landlords being accredited will give tenants a bit more reassurance that properties that they are renting are safe and well managed. Um, so that's my report in a nutshell. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Does anybody on the committee have immediate questions? <laughs> Amanda. Just in case I missed it, Lucy. Um, how many um, unlicensed HMOs do you think you have approximately in Milton Keynes? Um, we have HMOs that we know about. We have approximately about 800 in total and about 400 of those are licensed. And we know of about 400 that aren't licensed. The properties that aren't licensed are because they're not subject. So it means that they've probably got three to four people in that are unrelated. Um, the properties that we do know about that are unlicensed, we do actively um, carry out compliance checks along with the HMOs that are licensed to ensure landlords are keeping up their responsibilities. And then obviously any new HMOs that come to light and get reported to us, then we investigate those to ensure they're up to standard and licensed where necessary. Okay, thank you very much. Can I ask how long it takes typically to get an HMO license now? What's, what's the queue like? <laughs> um, we're quite sort of fairly up to standard now. We had a bit of a change in legislation a few years ago and had a bit of a backlog, but we're generally up to standard. The applications that come in, um, they get you know seen within the next sort of few weeks and the licensing process itself is a little bit lengthy. Um, it takes probably about two months from issuing the first um, proposal documents to licence to actually then granting it. Thank you. And what's the sort of proportion of cases where somebody says this is a high mo, but as far as you can tell, there's no evidence to support that? Well, you still get Because at one point we were getting large numbers of accusations that, that the council said it couldn't prove, even though it might suspect. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's hard to put a figure off the top of my head, but, you know, we investigate all, you know, reports. It may be that some of those, it turns out to be quite a large family, um, you know, and it may not be a HMO. Um, but not. I don't say there's a, probably a great proportion of those. I think most of the reports that come through, you know, we, we do confirm it is a HMO. It may be that the landlord wasn't aware. Obviously, things change a little bit, like you know, what David's example is, and it just tips that balance over into being a HMO. Um, but in all honesty, we probably don't get a high volume of cases where we're going out and actually identifying that it's not. Thanks, that's good to hear, because that used to be a big problem. Um, on, if an, anybody else got any more questions? I I guess maybe I'm the only one here whose ward has a large amount of rented, private rented housing. So, um, uh, right, yes, go on, come on in. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, it's a more general co um, comment around the private sector housing and from the partnership and our partners in the voluntary sector's perspective. Uh, one of the things that's being highlighted as a matter of real concern is the voluntary sector's access to private landlords in Milton Keynes. We know there's a huge amount of work going on within Milton Keynes Council, not least of which was in the private sector uh, housing um, uh, department that, that Lucy's talking about and we would be really interested in exploring with whomever that needs to be how we can ensure that not only those that come to the council's door can look at access to private landlords but also the voluntary sector who are currently also trying to access private landlords for those that we're trying to prevent becoming homeless in the first place. So it's, it's um, in, in that context, Chair. Thank you. Um, sorry, Emily, you wanted to come in. <laughs> I was going to pick up two points on this um, that I think would be really useful for, well, what, one, uh, in terms of picking up on, on Tracy's point. Um, she is right, we're doing a huge amount of work with private sector landlords, and we have a huge amount of work going on with them through mixed team with temporary accommodation, and it completely changed that relationship with them so that we are being offered to um, being able to offer two-year ASTs through private landlords, 
you know, so, um, doing many different types of relationships and very happy for us to look at how we work better with the voluntary sector on that. But I just wanted to put a bigger, wider context about the private sector housing issue in Milton Keynes that we have right now. It is one of the things that's driving our rest sleeping and homelessness numbers. Um, as somebody who also has a lot of private accommodation, a lot of ex-council that is now rented out in my in my ward, um, there there is a from my perspective a significant lack of understanding from private landlords about their rights and responsibilities, um, and so that is one of the reasons we've introduced the private landlord scheme. But finally, the bigger issue and one that I don't know if this committee can do anything to help with, because um, I'm a bit at a loss, but we are the only country in Europe and North America where private renters don't have proper rights. You know, this is not, uh, this is not some you know, Nordic socialist idea. This is every other country in Europe, the America, Canada, and met in many other countries around the world, the private renters have rights. Uh, and those rights include tenure, they include rent capping, they include um, rights to be protected when they complain about landlords um, that are properly enforced and understood, um, and it completely transforms the private sector market. And I don't know if it's because in the UK we've never properly considered private rent as being part of the housing sector, you know, a part of the housing sector that we want to promote and develop. Um, but it is clearly an important part of people trying to get on the housing ladder to, to be in rented first. I think we all probably did that, right? Probably all rented uh, before, we, before we were able to buy places and we still have people renting today who are in the exact same situation. So, I, you know, if there's something the committee can do to, to further investigate that in MK or pressure that they can help us put on to get some kind of scheme around that in in the in the UK, I think that would make a significant difference to both the quality of the private sector housing that we've got in the private sector rented accommodation that we've got in Milton Keynes, but also would help address our temporary accommodation homelessness situation. I'm sure any idea is very very welcome because. This is one of the biggest problems. <laughs> um, can I ask a little more? You've said that they have to meet minimum standards of energy efficiency. So what's the standard for private rented sector? Um, um, currently, the minimum energy efficiency standard for rented properties is an energy performance rating of an E. Um, obviously, the work we're going to do with the 10-year intelligence survey is going to hopefully um, identify you know, properties across Milton Keynes, what their EPC ratings are. Um, properties that are rented and they have an F or a G rating, that is now prohibited. So obviously, we would want to identify any of those properties so we can engage with landlords and make improvements. We are aware government has ambitions to perhaps raise that rating to a C, um, which would mean that, you know, there probably are quite, I imagine there's probably quite a lot of properties with E ratings. So there's maybe a lot of work landlords may need to do to improve properties if that's the case. And obviously, you know, by us carrying out this survey will help us be prepared to know where those properties are and help engage and support those landlords to, you know, look at the opportunities and funding available that's out there to help improve these properties. Thank you. Um, that was, oh, well, go on, Ed first. So I've kind of got a question on this, it's about the landlord accreditation scheme. So I don't know if you want to come back on that point. Um, on the survey, we have, I think, tens of thousands of rented properties in Milton Keynes. What sort of size of survey are you going to do? Uh, the survey we're looking at is going to encompass, um, well, it's going to identify where all our private rental properties are. So it is a big survey. 
um, is a desktop survey. So it's looking at all the council tax data, benefits data, all the information that we hold, information on the UPC register. So we can um, basically produce a property database that is predicting where our HMOs are, predicting where our hazards are, and giving us that information on EPC. So I imagine it's got to be large because I would hope that we're getting all that information on all the private rented properties at street level. Okay. I so don't know off the top of my head, how many properties that we have that are private rented in Milton Keynes, but obviously that's something we'll find out from this survey. Okay, but that means that the energy rating that that's going to give you is only the energy rating as per the plans or, or whatever. You're not um, going to get anything. Of it. it will be... Because a lot of the time the energy rating is very bad because of the condition of the property, because the window frames haven't been replaced or whatever. Yeah, it's, I mean, it is going to give us the EPC rating. So all properties that are rented have to have an EPC certificate. So it will give us that. I do appreciate that, you know, some properties might have changed and degraded over the years. So maybe that doesn't marry up to what that sort of um, representation is. But that should then be picked up in perhaps the hazard predictions. So we can hopefully scoop up those properties as well. Right, okay, that at least means that it's got some basis for much better information. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ed. So I think, that for me, the landlord accreditation scheme is also quite a fascinating scheme, but it's something that, I guess, it's opt-in. So actually, we're not going to capture all landlords by it, um, and it's a real shame that we don't have those protections for tenants in this country, because actually this sign up something like this should be a mandatory um, requirement, and then that will probably help us understand how many home, um, rented properties we've got private rented. Um, what are we looking to do to engage with landlords and to reach out and get them signed up to this? Because we want as many as we can, and I suppose those who don't have good conditions of their properties, are they actually going to sign up to it? Uh, I mean, we are working with our comms team and with the National Residential Landlord Association on various sort of communication activities to try and reach as many people as possible so they know about the scheme and they can sign up. I do appreciate that, yes, accreditation is probably going to scoop up more of the landlords that are a little bit more compliant anyway, or perhaps are on that edge and would like to take up the opportunity to upskill and improve their properties. There's always going to be landlords that are going to fall out of that bracket. Um, but hopefully the data that we get about people signing up may give us a bit more information about perhaps areas in Milton Keynes where there's we know there's rented properties, but we're not getting a lot of take up from landlords for the scheme. And then maybe we could take out some sort of more targeted approaches to engaging with those landlords, finding out a bit more why they maybe don't want to be accredited or they're not signing up and seeing what we can do to encourage it. Jenny, can I add to that answer? Yeah, is that right? Um, so when we when we looked at the scheme, that was my very first question. You know, the people that are going to want to participate are going to be the ones that want to be good landlords. And there's a lot of people out there that are. And I don't want to kind of paint this picture that I think all landlords are bad. They're not. Some, some only have one rented property and it just happens to be their mother's old house and they don't, you know, they don't really know what they're supposed to be doing, but they want to do the right thing. Some people have it as a business and have several properties. Um, you know, so, so with, and again, if you've got lot, quite a lot of properties, you probably want to, to, to be aware of the rules. Um, it is just the first step and in, in the private sector, what do we call it, the private sector um, rented accommodation strategy that I took to cabinet back in December. We talk about it being that first stage. We want to see a bit how it goes. Um, and if we don't see the level of take up, then we are gonna have to look at other things, but we are limited by government legislation. So you'll see that we are trying to be more proactive about the powers that we do have. And you have a, you've got a summary of what Lucy's team has been able to do. Um, with those reports in, one of the key things is we want to make clear that people who are renters should be reporting this stuff in and what their, they don't get any information about what their rights and responsibilities are. So one of the things we want to promote is what we can do to support them. Um, but, um, but, you know, it, it is, 
you know, you got to work with the best first. You got to, and and then you got to use the carrot to work with the best and improve the sector as much as possible. But you, but we retain that the the limited stick that we have through the government legislation where people aren't engaging and aren't doing the right things. Um, I'll add one other question. We, one of the major issues is going to be starting to insulate homes and, and getting the energy efficiency up. Do we have or can we start to look at this year, given that we have some money in the budget for this, providing a, an active advice service so that res, uh, uh, landlords can find out through us where they can go to get grants to help with this because some of the costs are considerable? Mm. Yeah, one hundred percent, Jenny. That's um, as you know, we put that additional money in the budget. That was for all private owners. That does not exclude uh, the private rented sector as well. Um, it is a significant challenge, but we also know it saves the money in the long run. But a lot of people won't have the ten thousand pound output that they need to, in order to do those upgrades to their house, even though they know that they'll get that money back quite quickly through the energy cost savings and in fact even quicker now given the current price of ener energy. Um, yes, so we're, we're all we, we, what we want to make sure is that any government scheme or any help that's available working with organizations in Milton Keynes that they can, they can make those upgrades because I think people are a bit lost about what's right, what's what should I do? I don't even understand what would make the biggest difference on my house. I'm, I'm nervous to call up a company and just ask them because they'll sell me whatever they think they can sell me. You know, so they, they, people do need proper advice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There's also the, the question of trusted trader, effectively, that I've certainly had a stream of residents asking me. I've had somebody put this through the door about the energy scheme. How do I know that it's real? Um, and having a point where the council could, or encouraging the energy companies to register their schemes with us so that we can give that advice would be very helpful. And of course, that, it, it, one of the problems that we have with private landlords is that it's not them that are going to benefit from reduced heating bills, it's the tenants, and therefore there's a, a conflict of interest to some extent there. <laughs> um, Depends what they've got the property for. If it's yeah. a long-term investment for them, then there is a benefit to them. But it, but you're right. Um, they they don't see the the savings in their energy costs. But but you know so some of them will want to do it anyways as part of the maintenance program. Sometimes it's just about making that decision that if you need a new roof, what kind of roof you get and what kind of insulation you put into that roof at the time of the new roof will save you lots of money in the long run because um, you're going to have to do the new roof anyways, right? So, so it's about having that proper advice. I like that idea a lot, Jenny. It's about have about um, about if we can do some kind of trust a trader scheme in in Milton Keynes and have that more promoted on our website. So, if that you wanted to recommend that from the committee, I'd be very very open to that. Um, can I add to that, please? Uh, and also, perhaps a a scheme for the companies to register that they've got a, a scheme going at the moment. Yeah. So okay. what I was going to say was that obviously there's been you know, a whole spate of, uh, should we say, rogue, well, people um, performing rogue insulations um, on housing. And then, of course, the people who have had the insulation through a grant have ended up with incredible problems with their house in terms of mould and damp um, and the like. And then, of course, then it costs thousands and thousands to get the insulation removed. I wonder whether or not it would also be worth maybe promoting um, something like um, Civali, which is one of these, it was set up um, in order to try and um, promote people to go in the right direction to find um, the right kind of cavity wall insulation um, products rather than going to some bloke who's just recommended somebody else in the pub and then they find they have all these issues. Um, They've, um, it was set up by a woman in uh, Newport, South Wales, because she and her husband had massive issues because they were in a council house and they paid to have some insulation and before they knew it, they had mold and damp growing. She's been to the House of Commons. She's, she has literally pounded the streets about this. It's worth looking into, Emily. Um, I think you'd be quite interested. 
I'd be very happy for you to send, if you could send me the details of that, be, we'd be very interested. I know that Jenny would also be very interested um, in her role, but I, I really do think there's something there about lives in people's Keynes confidence. Now. Well, fab, she can come in and see me. She lives in Milton Keynes now. Great, so, great, great. So send me, send me her contact details. Be very happy to meet with her and talk through, because I do think we need to have people's confidence, particularly because some of the stuff we're talking about is new technologies, um, and even in the insulation, it gets very complicated very quickly about what what these new insulations actually mean and what that you know. It, so it can be quite overwhelming for anybody who's looking to do work on their house. So I'd be very, we'd be very happy to look at anything we can to facilitate people in Milton Keynes making those improvements because it will really help us achieve our climate change targets and reduce our energy bills. Thanks. Are there any more comments or recommendations? We're in danger of finishing early. <laughs> I, I think the other thing that really strikes me is I, I think from memory we have somewhere in the order of 30,000 rented properties in Milton Keynes, private rented. So to say we've had 450 complaints is just over 1%. I'm not sure that those of us who have a high number of rented properties in our ward would believe that that's the number of complaints we should have. Um, so are there any things that you are working on to get information out? You, you've mentioned a little, I think, in the report, but are there any inf more that you're working on or are there any ideas that people can have to get the information out to residents, to tenants, that there is a source of help to talk to their landlords to try and get repairs if it's if the problem is serious, um, because the lack of people coming and bringing cases to the council is probably the biggest thing that's slowing up action. Um, yeah, I agree, Jenny, and which is partly why we're doing this tenure intelligence survey to try and you know reach those tenants. But yeah, by all means, I'm quite happy to look at how we can publicise our department more and perhaps do some work with comms and how we can publicise the service we offer and how we can reach um, a wider audience so people do know about our service and you know do feel that they can come and speak to us and um, we can obviously offer the support that they need. Thank you. One, one obvious possibility might be for you to produce a, an article for parish council newsletters so that all the parish councils could cover something in their newsletters. Yeah, I'm quite happy and, to and do if that. We can supply that to councillors as well. Those who put out newsletters can also get it out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I'm more than happy to do that. So we have a recommendation that we set up some form of advice service using any service that's available, and there's a government register of the electricity uh, of the energy company schemes, for instance. But to get more advice to residents, both about individual products and about funded schemes and and trusted traders. Um, I think we have congratulations, serious congratulations, on getting the high mode licensing under control because that was a major backlog a few years ago and it's great to hear that that is now almost gone. Um, it's welcome news, very welcome news that you're doing the tenure intelligence stock condition survey because that really will start to reach those tenure and those properties that the residents are not telling us about. Um, we have a recommendation on the parish news item. Um, I think that's it. Unless anybody has anything else? No? Oh, actually, just for people's information, can you just cover quickly, what are your responsibilities in relation to housing association property? Because it's, it's different there, isn't it? But it's not zero, if I remember rightly. Yeah, housing associations, because they are set up a bit like councils and they have, you know, their own maintenance teams and maintenance programmes and obviously complaints, um, you know, corporate complaint systems as well. We would expect, you know, them to be responding 
adequately to repair issues. However, if they are not, we do have powers to enforce and to take action against um, housing associations. I don't think we ever really have off the top of my head. We tend to, if things do come up, a few phone calls, meetings, and it usually gets things moving and things resolved. And we would always say to any tenants that do come through to us to raise it through that housing stations um, corporate complaints procedure and have it addressed. And then that can obviously go up to the ombudsman if it's you know not satisfactorily dealt with. So yes, we do have powers but we would generally respect um, in, well, expect housing associations to be able to deal with their issues and repair and maintenance problems. Thanks. Uh, and I can second that from my ward experience that uh, <clears throat> I've had a couple of cases over the years where the housing associations were dragging their feet to a major extent yeah. and involving the council has been helpful. It hasn't, as you say, it hasn't led to formal action but they've got their problems fixed. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I do urge councillors to take that route if you need to. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. I think that's it. Um, in that case, thank you very much for the report. Um, David, you've not asked any other questions, but are you at least satisfied with the direction in which it's going? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, right. On the back page of the agenda, or the final page, we have the work programme proposals from the um, planning group. And I think we'd add on this something on reviewing the uh, homelessness prevention. Scheme. Sorry. Why don't you do it in March next year? Then you've had a whole. They've had a whole year to get to grips with the strategy. And how yes, I guess it depends it. whether we want to be upfront in mm. helping to. Suggestion. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, normally a committee like this would actually be involved as the strategy is set to to put in ideas about how it uh, things that might help it. We haven't had the opportunity because of the timing not fitting so much of the time. So I, I think the other recommendation we would have, please, is that all aspects of the housing, both Victoria's and um, Stuart's, look more carefully at their forward plan and talk to us about when things are going to come up so that we have the chance to plan in some pre-policy um, discussion because that's been completely impossible this year. And it is supposed to be the major part of our work. <laughs> um, thank you. Does anybody want to make any comments about the list of topics we've got there? Okay. Right. Okay. Um, we also have two information items. They are only they are for information to let you know. One of them. Yeah, one of them is the cabinet response and the other is the young people's housing related support project. Um, unfortunately, that is not actually the project that we asked for the information on. So we're also asking that the other project, which was the housing sufficiency project, also give us a written report in the meantime so that we can see that as well. Because there was a problem identified a few years ago with young people's housing and that's partly what kicked off that project. Um, and we'd obviously like an update. Thank you. Apart from that, I think if nobody's got any other they want to raise, then that closes the business for this year, except to thank Liz, who has been phenomenally helpful in rounding up all the reports and witnesses and so on, um, and giving us very good minutes all year. And Victoria and... <laughs> <laughs> Right. And Victoria, and in his absence, um, Stuart Prophet, for making sure that we have a, a very good relationship with the staff who service this area with the committee. And that's, that really is helpful to the committee's work. Thank you. And thank you also to the Cabinet member for um, coming. Uh, thank you for also for the Cabinet member for regularly being part of this um, scrutiny committee. 
thanks to the cabinet member also for regularly coming. Yes, um, and also of course to the to uh, Sarah, is it for community safety as well? Thank you. Okay, thank you.